Living in paradise means dealing with the storms and floodwaters from time to time. A new research we've uncovered shows that flooding is projected to get worse even if you don't live along the coast. ABC Action News reporter Rochelle Aline is going in depth tonight. She's breaking down the key issues and searching for possible solutions. Flooding. It's often synonymous with hurricanes and heavy rains. But recently, I combed through several new studies that show between now and 2050, rising sea levels and stronger storms mean the problem will get worse for everyone, not just folks who live along the coast. And one study in particular, published on Nature.com, goes on to show that black communities and lower income communities are likely to be most heavily hit. I spoke to environmental expert Jennifer Jones at Florida Gulf Coast University about this, and she says the issue is systemic. Black communities, historically impoverished communities, are often located in lands that already have a lot of risk built in. They might be low-lying lands, they might be sited next to industrial areas, and, and so forth. Another important thing to understand is that black communities and impoverished communities historically lacked uh, investment in uh, flood maintenance and flood mitigation and those sorts of, of strategies. And then, you know, I would also say that today black communities and impoverished communities are increasingly um, at risk because many households today lack resources to recover from a natural disaster like flooding. And it's a trend researchers at USF also noticed while working on a flood vulnerability study in Hillsborough County back in 2020. There are areas like East Lake Orient Park, Del Rio, the eastern part of Ybor City, and areas east of McKay Bay. If this news sounds depressing, I get it. It's a lot to take in, but I also wanted to speak to people right here in our community that are doing something about it. So I started at the top. My name is Sean Sullivan. Sullivan is the executive director at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, which brings together six Bay Area counties, dozens of cities, researchers, developers, and more to talk about resiliency. Essentially, they're looking for ways to help communities bounce back from things like flooding, heat, storms, and other natural occurrences. We partnered with a private foundation over the last 22 months uh, called the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Uh, and we, received, we received funding from them to develop uh, housing resilience. And among the things that we, we are doing in this study is to look at the impact of uh, extreme weather on homes and structures that are in, reside in environmental justice communities. Because we know that folks who, who, who struggle a bit uh, are um, typically the most vulnerable, and that's just not right. They say the results of that study will be released in May, but what they can share right now is that when it comes to communities most impacted, better maintenance for existing buildings is key. If we work now to become more resilient, I think our future is brighter. We protect our investment, which for most people is their home, is your, your highest investment in your portfolio. To get a better understanding of what other solutions are possible, I also spoke with Terrence Sabia, the director of the Florida Center for Community Design and Research at USF. She tells me in Hillsborough County the solutions will differ by location. In addition to better maintenance, when it comes to inland flooding, she tells me that more parks could also be added as a possible fix. Things like floodable parks um, can be mechanisms of defense and can be strategies for helping to be able to direct and hold water in places where it's safe until it can dissipate. Um, and floodable parks are also a great amenity for communities because when they're not holding water, they're open spaces that can actually be used um, for recreation by the communities that are nearby. Along the coast and other waterways, Sabia says creating a living shoreline is an option. It essentially means taking natural materials like plants, sand and rocks and using them to slow water down to protect seawalls and other barriers that prevent flooding. So as that water comes up, instead of the water coming up and hitting the wall or coming over the wall and pulling the wall away, 
a living shoreline allows the water to come up more slowly. And so it has a lot less impact on the structures that may be sitting behind it. And while there seems to be planning in place to protect buildings we already have, we also wanted to know how this information factors into new buildings. A more obvious solution is to build higher so water can pass underneath. But local developer Taylor Ralph tells me there's much more that can be done. Other things that are even further along are things like preparing a building to be flooded and actually uh, creating uh, the first floor that actually is planned to either flood and putting in materials that don't get um, to, uh, ruined if they are flooded or to actually waterproof the exterior of the building to where water cannot go inside the building. So those are pretty you know, expensive or at least more expensive um, ideas. And while the development community is mulling over their own solutions, Ralph adds that they're also having to work with local leaders to make sure everyone is on the same page. Municipalities are studying flood impacts aggressively, you know, extensively, and they're also looking at, you know, what can we do to mitigate the risk that our community has? And it might start at the level of should we build in flood prone areas should we build in areas that you know we know are going to flood during a storm surge but also could be can we incentivize developers to do things that mitigate or reduce their impact on our infrastructure should this happen in tampa rochelle aline abc action news